Hi guys, welcome to this edition of Arm Care IQ. Today we're going to talk about Serape training concepts. And this really follows the previous lecture that I put out on speaking about separation and stretch loading. And we looked at it from a biomechanical quantitative lens, where now we're going to get into the more applied component of, of that type of uh, research and uh, talk about some exercise concepts. So uh, here we go. So let's just revisit this real quick. Um, if those of you have not seen the previous Arm Care IQ, uh, we are looking at the data as far as the separation angles. And so essentially, if you look at the shape, I'm just gonna revisit it. In our training, we want to be able to create a wider and deeper valley. And when I talk about wider, that means more time between when the, uh, the trunk and pelvis singulate or when they don't make an angle between each other, okay? So when there's no separation, we want more time, a little bit more separation time. And we wanna be able to have a deeper valley, meaning that there's much greater uh, range of motion between the hips and the trunk in terms of separation, okay? So that's an important concept um, that we're gonna talk about in this particular Arm Care IQ. So what's the Serape? Um, the, the Serapa is a, it's essentially, it's a Latin scarf and it's really serves as a model of how our muscles, our tissues, our fascia. So the casings of muscles are arranged in the body. So essentially it's an interconnection between one opposite side, lower limb and the opposite side, upper limb. So there's contralateral connection. You can see how it crisscrosses in between. And at the back, it's got this crisscross wrap and there's some key muscles that are involved. And, uh, you know, one is the serratus anterior, two is the rhomboids, which are at the back. Okay. So movement of your shoulder blade actually helps you to rotate your trunk. Um, and, uh, of course the obliques and this interconnection happens, you know, all the way down to essentially your knees, you know, working through the adductors, um, hamstrings, all of these muscles that work on the contralateral side between front and back have to interconnect with each other. And what happens if you think of this serape uh, scarf, when you're counter rotating your trunk, so when we talk about creating more of a, a separation between the trunk and the pelvis, you're creating stretch along the diagonal lines of this serape scarf, this, this, uh, crisscrossed scarf that you're wearing in terms of uh, reflecting your muscles and your tissues in your body. And so, you know, I just had one with the picture. So just thinking of this, you know, our muscles are arranged to allow us to create a huge amount of stretch in a diagonal pattern. And so what happens is, okay, we talked about singulation in the, uh, in the, the past presentation. And so when you counter rotate your hips away from the trunk, so when you're you know, at peak knee height and your hips are moving away from the trunk, you're creating a stretch on one side of the body on the back side of that serape scarf. And then all of a sudden that hip swings around and you have the motor control because we have to have strong rhomboids at the back and holding the scarf in the opposite direction creates tension, creates diagonal tension from the lead hip to the opposite shoulder. And we, we need that tension because this elasticity when you then go to contract and recoil. So now we're going back to singulation again, where at maximum external rotation, hopefully that's the point where our trunk and our pelvis are lined up is now we're taking all that rotational energy and we're putting it into forward flexion as much as we can into the, the direct line of the target. So I want you to, to get a good grasp of how um, the structure of our muscles and tissues interlay in our body and how we train it. We're going to get into that. So one way to train this is with blocked rotation. So one of the arm care IQs, we talked about the hip lock position. And that's basically a position in which the back leg is extended almost like toe off and sprinting is where you want to get to. And that really stabilizes the, uh, the hip. It, it, it co-contracts the hip. So now when you have this real stable pelvis and blocked rotation, and you generally will see it by putting the same leg as your throwing arm forward you then can create much more counter rotation focused on the trunk in a drill. Okay. I know that was a lot. I'm going to show you a, a little demonstration. You can see in the uh, illustration that we have, 
it's a pitcher that's doing a, a, a reverse pickoff throw. And you can see the lead leg is ahead of the throwing arm. And again, the back leg is, is in co-contraction. If you're straighten everything out, if you're straightening out that back leg, you're trying to put it into co-contraction because now you are training your body to rotate away. You're making a throw, you're rotating your trunk away from your lead leg. So now you're creating even more of a stretch response and you're creating some stability and motor control in the pattern. Um, I'm going to play a video of a guy that I really respect in the industry named Ben Brewster. Uh, he's phenomenal. I love listening to his stuff. He, he really knows how to simplify performance and throwing, but um, he basically goes through this uh, uh, reverse pick drill and he's a lefty. So you can see, look at his back leg, look at how his back leg is straightened as much as he can. So that, that position of his hip is locked. So now he's really focusing on um, the, the trunk rotation, his rhomboids taking back that shoulder blade to pull back even more of his trunk. So that's one thing that I think is really important. Uh, and, and when he throws, you can even see that back leg is, is straightened as well. So he's really trying to keep that, that, um, real co-contracted hip. It's not like his, his knees flexing in and caving in as he's throwing. Um, and I, I just like, I appreciate watching what this guy does. So I wanted to use him as an example. Um, so, you know, let's get into some exercise. So this one is, is a, it's a constraint led dissociation. So you're actually using some load to get you into the constraint with deceleration. We're putting some things together. Previous arm care IQ, I talked about deceleration training, the kinematic sequence. Um, and essentially, you know, remember, I'll just go down to this graph. Hopefully you guys can see it on the back side. When we hit our peak speeds, the deceleration is really important. And, um, what you can see is that the, the, the simultaneous deceleration, when they both come together, I believe, and I haven't really qualified it in biomechanical data, I need to, but I think that happens very close to when the arm is at full layback, because now you're trying to keep all your, you're, you're trying to keep your segments singulated so that everything's moving to home plate. So a lot of these drills, you're going to see that there is a deceleration position when the trunk and the pelvis are facing forward. Okay. So deceleration is really a key feature of this, including training the serape or the stretch loading position. So let's play the video. Okay. This is essentially just a pullback drill. I got the ball way outside my base of support. Okay. On, on the direction that I'm going to rotate. And what I'm trying to do is create momentum with the ball that I'm pulling myself back. I'm also trying to engage my rhomboids, right? Engage my rhomboids as much as I possibly can. Um, and so I'm allowing this, this weight to help me stretch my obliques. Okay. And I'm creating separation in this, in this pattern. Now, unlike most med ball activities, I'm not, I don't have an implement that I'm letting it go. When you let go of, an, of a med ball, your deceleration needs go down. Obviously you're not holding on to anything. There's no weight to be able to decelerate. And so I like doing a lot of med ball work holding on because now I have to, I have to stabilize it. And so you can see the point where I get to, the, to decel I'm singulated. You can see my, my pelvis and trunk are in, are in a similar position. Um, and so, you know, that's one key concept in training diso dissociation with a constraint. Okay. So let's go into accentuating this. Now we're, we're creating an accentuation. Now you see a lot of drills in throwing um, uh, uh, called janitor drills. There's a lot of people that are putting this stuff on to, to try to improve, you know, your pelvic trunk separation, to be able to hold things back while the, while the lower half and your upper half held back your upper trunk, while the lower half is, is now progressing, uh, towards home plate. And so this is a similar concept. However, now, instead of putting the weight in the frontal plane, I'm putting it in front of me and I'm doing a reverse step to increase what's called the mass moment of inertia. I'm trying to put mass further away from my axis of rotation. You know, if I'm a figure skater, if I want to rotate faster, I'm going to be pulling my arms in. I'm going to rotate a lot quicker, right. Than have my arms out. But with this particular drill, I'm trying to keep the ball as far as possible for my body to give me resistance to rotation. So it's going to help me hold my trunk back because some of these drills have to help a little bit with not only coordination, but tissue extensibility. You know, that's another problem. One, it's stability, motor control, and being able to keep your trunk back. But two, 
you know, we have to be concerned with tissue extensibility, you know, and I'm a stiff mover, you know, you're going to see some, some pitchers and hitters that are stiff movers. And, you know, you might think, okay, well, um, what if I take a stiff mover and I make them too loose? It's going to be hard to do that, but you want to have them some concept of having the motor control to delay, even if they don't have a huge amount of, of um, separation, you want to create the separation time. You want them to hold at least a delay. You know, I've worked with some elite athletes that don't have very great separation, but what they do have is the ability to keep um, their, their trunk further away from their pelvis. And so it doesn't have this, you know, slow pelvis, a really fast trunk effect where they singulate um, too early. You know, there's, there's a separation between singulation while they're in single support on one leg. And then when they land, there's some time between that before the trunk gets caught up to singulation again. So this helps with the timing pattern. You know, usually good stretch responses, they have to have stretch speed sequence. These are all things that I think are very helpful in the, in the drills that I'm showing here. So let's, let's just get to the video. You can see this is just uh, a front version, you know, where I'm rotating away again and getting to this like simultaneous deceleration position where I'm holding it. I'm putting the, the weight away. So I'm getting co-contraction from the front and back of me um, in this position. It's a, it's a pretty simple drill. It really is. Um, and here's just when I'm coming on to you, I'm just sending that weight away in front of me, that weight is kind of holding me back for a split second as I'm pulling in and rotating. I got some of that mass that is keeping my trunk peeled away from my, my pelvis. Okay. Lots of ways to do this. I'm just giving uh, a couple examples here. Okay. So now let's go into the tissue extensibility. So, so this is one where you're basically, it's, a, it's an active stretch because I'm using one side to rotate me to the other. So now we're working on actually creating some extensibility in the athlete, okay? So I'm just got a, a stick. And what I'm doing is I'm just following my hand and, and so I'm rotating to my right, okay? So I really wanna work on the counter rotation. I feel like getting the stretch loading, I gotta move away from my left leg. So again, look at, I'm in the block rotation position. So I have my, my throwing leg forward. I have my back leg extended as much as I possibly can to hip lock. And then what I'm doing is I'm just, I'm utilizing my throwing hand to kind of just pull me back, you know, and in the same token, I'm engaging my rhomboids. So I'm helping them the stability and motor control in that pattern. Okay. So that's just, that, that's just kind of a rhomboid focused position. Okay. Now I want to tell you about something else. So this can be used in the uh, reverse pick throwing as well. In, in a lot of things that we do with block tip rotation where you know you have one leg that's extended behind you, you have your throwing leg forward. But I got a picture of the guy who is squatting, okay? Baseball player is squatting. Now, when you squat, if you have a closed glottis and usually high level squatters, power lifters, they are not breathing, okay? During the lift, they're breathing at the top. And the reason being, is that they're creating intra-abdominal pressure, IAP, to stabilize the spine. Obviously, when you have high loads on your back, um, you, you're, you're creating a lot of tension because you're filling up your, your lungs with air. You know, you're, it, it's expanding your, your gut, and it's basically your, your uh, abdominal wall when your, your glottis is closed, called the Valsalvin maneuver. It's creating some kind of bracing. It's pushing on your stomach which is being held really tightly against your spine. Now that creates, that creates stiffness in the proximal element of the body, in the central part of your body, it creates stiffness. And you need stiffness to be able to move the weight really quickly. Can you imagine if you had 400 pounds on your back and you go down in a squat and you breathe everything out, you're gonna collapse and the bar's gonna fall on your neck. Like you, you don't want that to happen. But in our drills, it's important to trigger that intra-abdominal pressure. So expanding your diaphragm and, and getting your belly as fat as possible, okay? And then also releasing as much air as possible. So it's fine if you're doing a reverse pick uh, uh, throwing movement, it's fine to take your time and breathe, breathe into more counter rotation, taking up the slack. So, you know, here's a drill for that, all right? So I basically, that's me. I'm stuck. You can see I'm stuck. 
I can't get past there on my own, but now I breathe myself into more rotation. I'm, ex- I'm letting the air out of my lungs and my gut, and I'm trying to expire everything out so that I can reduce my intra-abdominal pressure and stiffness to get a little more tissue extensibility. Okay. So hopefully that concept makes sense. Again, I'm in the, in, in the blocked hip position where I have my lead leg, my throwing leg forward. Okay. Because I do want to improve my counter rotation. You you take a look at athletes. If you put them in, let's say you stood behind them and they had their legs straight feet right together. Okay. And uh, hands by their sides. And you ask them, Hey, you know, rotate to your throwing shoulder. Okay. You see them rotate to the throwing shoulder and they say, okay, rotate to your non-throwing shoulder. And you see them rotate their non-throwing shoulder. I bet you 99% of the time that they're going to have much more multi-segmental rotation going to their glove arm than they will with their throwing arm. And especially in hitters, because think of our expansion training, right? You're, You're not letting go of the bat. You're swinging that bat. You're decelerating that bat. And that bat is being used to create tissue extensibility on your dominant side. And so you're gaining range. We, we typically in throwing athletes, we typically have more range in the acceleration rotation uh, position than the counter movement loaded position. And we want to improve the loading. You know, you think of an elastic band, we want a little bit more elasticity if we can. Again, if it's a stiff mover, then you, you want to be able to have the stability and motor control that they can hold the separation time and create that stretch. That, that they're able to, you know, utilize that, that proximal elastic energy. Okay. So let's go to the next. So the next one um, that I have is, is actually an arm focused uh, rhomboid activation. I just call it an arm bar. You put in a bar 90 degrees, it's going in your hand. Okay. Now this is one that you're, you're actually going to be in your typical contralateral pattern, your non-throwing arm leg forward. And you're basically just trying to activate your rhomboids while you're in sort of an arm up position. Okay. And again, you're trying to use your own stability and motor control and not resist it uh, with anything around your midsection to keep yourself back. And it's very hard. You're going to see, I have a, I have a real hard uh, time keeping myself back because I am a stiff mover. So, you know, here I am, you know, I got this little bar in my hand. You could use anything. You could use a mobility stick, a dowel. It doesn't matter. Just something that's around 90 degrees that you have to engage your rhomboids to stay back while I'm trying to push. I'm trying to push my hips forward. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to push my hips forward, trying to stay back. And I'm trying to create some extensibility that way with an arm bar position. Okay. Um, so that's that one. And again, you know, this is all, you know, I gave a lot of theory in the previous two arm care IQs where we're talking about, um, the separation and stretch loading, how we're quantifying it and also deceleration. So we need to know the kinematic sequence and, you know, please review it. And and then we also need to know the, uh, the dissociation, you know, and, and how we, how we, um, quantify it. I'd like for everybody to be able to understand that. So, um, I know I've talked about this before guys, and, uh, you know, I can't stress it enough. I, I really believe in our product and and we want to be able to uh, get you guys a discount and getting it and getting started. Um, we really are focused on the distal chain. We are focused on arm strength because where do other injuries happen? The arms. So we need to have some, uh, pretty, focus details there in terms of how to train it. Um, obviously all the proximal segments matter, but the most important feature is making sure the arm is strong because again, athletes may not have the same tissue extensibility, the same motor control and stability. These things are going to change. They're going to compensate a lot where you don't want compensation, where you don't want weakness, where you don't want to be overly lax is in your throwing arm. And so our product is just so focused on giving you data-led arm care training and assessment so that you don't make mistakes or guess that what you're doing is correct. So we really want to do everything we can to remediate and balances. Um, We're getting people in Australia, Canada, all over the place that are taking this in. It's just amazing to see how global this has become 
Um, and, and, you know, we want to get into other sports too. You might be a softball player that's watching this or a softball coach. You know, we really want to be able to accommodate you because we understand that the body throws, but the arm delivers. And so we have to worry about that part of the, the kinetic chain. Okay. So I hope you like this edition of Arm Care IQ. Thanks for watching.